Hello, this is Amanda Malave with Business 312 Principles of Marketing. Today we're going to go over Chapter 9, Developing New Products and Managing the Product Lifecycle. Over the last eight chapters, we've actually gone through many steps. One is understanding customer needs and wants. Then we designed a customer value driven marketing strategy by identifying target markets and segmenting and then developing um, differentiation and positioning statements that would create value. In chapter eight, we actually started to do a deeper dive into how do you create that value through marketing programs. One of them was to really understand what products and services are. Now we're actually going to go through, well, how do you create a product or a service? And what's the process to do that? Or some of the best practices. So from that standpoint, we're going to actually go step by step on creating a product for Amazon and all with the intent to capture value from our customers and in return we get profits and customer equity. Chapter 9 has four main objectives. One is to really understand how to develop new products. We're going to define the steps in product development and take into consideration how it is to manage through those processes. Then we'll go into the stages of product development and the cost and the profit stages that go with it and to really identify what marketing strategies we could implement at each stage. Last but not least, we'll go into the ethics part. For example, what are some of the social responsibility decisions that you have? Or maybe you're actually launching something that's gonna go international, so what do you do with it? So we'll talk about those as well. Let's get started with um, new product development strategy. Again, there's a way to obtain new products one is through acquiring. Um, a lot of companies acquire other companies um, to get their patents and their licenses. The one that we're going to be talking about more today is new product development, which is producing a product, whether it's internal or external, but you produce it yourself. And again, um, when there's anything with a little target, like here, just make sure um, that you really understand these concepts because they'll be in the quizzes and exams. Objective number one is to list and define new product development processes and the considerations in this process. So new product development has a core um, process of eight steps, all the way from idea generation to commercialization. We're actually going to walk through each step and discuss the pros and cons of each. So from an idea generation perspective, it's really, really critical to have a systematic approach. I know that a lot of people get inspired, but major corporations, especially Amazon um, and Intuit and Procter and & Gamble and uh, Google, they all have very, very specific ways to gather internal ideas. So today we're gonna go through Amazon. And as you may know, I worked at Amazon. I was the head of sales operations at Amazon Local and Amazon Fresh. And so I actually went through a specific process of creating a phone app for restaurants. So let's talk about how do you get ideas. So Amazon and Jeff Bezos has a very specific process. And if you'd like to go look at it, here's a link. In a overall um, summary, what Jeff Bezos does is he says that the devil's in the details and that PowerPoint actually is glides over some of the uh, more important ideas and that data is what's going to actually drive the idea generation process to make sure that your ideas are spot on. So anytime an Amazon worker has an idea to discuss, they ask to structure the pitch in a form of a four to six page memo, which the company calls a narrative or a white paper. Then they um, we then go into these meetings called the Wolf Packs, and we pitch our ideas. And for the first 20 minutes of this Wolf Pack meeting, which is all the higher executives, they'll read your idea and all of the supporting documents. Again, it has to be very succinct and in four to six pages. So that is the way that Amazon does that. Other ways to get um, ideas are through external sources. So you get information from distributors and suppliers, even competitors and customers. 
a lot of ideas come through social media, but you can also have a systematic approach like Lego does. Lego actually has a website called ideas.lego.com where kids will go and put their ideas there. Then there's something called crowdsourcing. That's when um, ideas come together in a community setting. One of these great examples to me is called 99designs. Um, as a consultant in marketing as well, um, in Hawaii, I use 99designs to create logos for me. I can actually put out what I want or some requirements, and anybody in the world can bid on creating a logo for me. It's really amazing. So again, ideas can be developed from an overall global standpoint. So that's what crowdsourcing is. So those are three ways to generate ideas. Let's take a look at an Amazon real life narrative. So this was my project, um, and this is a fact sheet with my narrative. I am not gonna give you the entire narrative because that is um, confidential information, but I'll give you the gist of it. So um, when I was at Amazon Fresh, um, what we decided to do was to launch a mobile app for Prime members. And what we wanted to do is give them an experience where they only go to one location to order their meals. So from that standpoint, here is a fact sheet which had the overall project description, some key data points, some project status, some forecast, key performance indicators, our names, etc. At the end of the day, um, it's really, really important that you see that Amazon is actually using every step that we're gonna go through in chapter nine um, to a T. So here's the narrative. And overall, the goal is for Amazon to launch a phone app in Seattle and Dallas so Prime customers have one-stop shopping on Amazon.com. So that was the idea generation process, and we would have taken that document with all supporting documents to the Wolfpack. But let's go through what we did before finalizing that final document. The first thing um, that we did, my colleague and I, is we actually went through idea screening, which is you would develop ideas and you figure out, is it a good idea? Is it a poor idea? And one of the best um, practices that we know was created by IBM, and this is called the RWW, and it's also a technology-based um, screening process. So the RWW uses data, um, and at Amazon, we had millions and millions and millions of lines of data, and we used active customer information, and we did regression analysis to understand their preferences and we correlated that to customer engagement, meaning we know that you know, 32 million customers on amazon.com, I'm just making up a number, I'm not gonna give you the exact one, um, what their preferences are and how they engage. And based off of that, you do regression analysis, which you should be learning in statistics, and based off of the highest statistical variation closest to one, that means that that um, is a high probability that that product or line of product, in this case, education and classes, is something that we feel that our customers at that time, which is in 2013, 2014, would really engage with. We also know that food and restaurants was the second and third options because the regression and analysis or the correlation data was closest to one. Adventures and activities, not so much, it was number 15. So we broke it down into categories. So again, um, we got a bunch of ideas. These are all different categories. And then we use data to whittle that down to restaurants and food. So the RWW framework says, is this a real product that you can give to your customers? Absolutely, that's a yes. Can you win at it? Is it important? Um, will it differentiate and com compete at a global level or even at a local level? And our answer was yes. Restaurants are huge, it's a billion dollar industry, and we know that our customers, because they're usually higher consuming customers um, from a overall standpoint, because we have all their cons 
consumption data, we also know that they spend a lot of money on high-end restaurants. So absolutely, restaurants is huge. And is it worth doing? Absolutely. We wanted to be the not the non-disputable um, one place that our prime members go to no matter what for all their purchases. So the RWW was yes, yes, yes. So the next step is, all right, well, now that we got this restaurant's idea, let's create the actual product. So the product idea is an idea for um, a possible product that we can offer. And again, there's a target here, so make sure you understand this. A product concept is the idea um, that puts it in meaningful terms. So from our standpoint, we would wanna make sure that our six page or four page white paper or narrative that we give to the Wolfpack at Amazon um, would really relate to the values of our customers and that our executives would understand it as well. Then, you know, does this product, um, the restaurant model, is it a way um, for consumers to perceive actual value? So from that perspective, we wanted to make, um, make sure that it was aligned with the overall Amazon image. So that's how we created a phone app for um, that was tied to amazon.com that you could order anything you wanted um, from any restaurant that we had on our platform. So again, um, Amazon uses um, the six page white paper narrative to really um, get you to think about what you're developing, does it align with Amazon corporate strategies, and will it bring value to the customer? So that is the concept development process um, at Amazon. After you get an idea and you self-screen through data, um, then you present it and you test it and the way we tested it was with our executives. Another way to test it is um, to actually test the product in a group of consumers, um, our target consumers. At Amazon, well, we needed to know, all right, well, where are we going to actually target them? And what data do we have to measure engagement and that restaurants are going to be a hit? So from that standpoint, we used engagement data. And one of the ways to do that, and again, we had millions and millions of code, and I had a statistical analyst that worked with me to gather all of this data. Um, and what she taught me is that one of the ways to measure engagement is seeing if they actually open up emails from Amazon. And the higher the percentage, the more that they're going to um, be engaged with us. And then we also have preferences, um, the preferences of things you buy, um, your demographic data, uh, how much you spend on Amazon.com. We have all that data. And so those preferences were used and that tied with um, your engagement level. We actually then broke it down by major cities in the United States. At the end of the day, we did a whole analysis of about 200 cities, and we decided on Seattle and Dallas. Again, we developed the concept. Um, we are going to submit it to the Wolfpack um, at Amazon's executive meetings, and we use data, um, maybe not necessarily go, to go out and, and test it right away, but we use data to actually circumvent that testing process because we have information that others may not have and therefore our data would tell us um, from a mathematical perspective if this idea was great. So once we've actually um, completed the uh, concept development and testing, we go into the marketing strategy development process, which is right here. So the marketing um, strategy development process, again, is really, really aligned with Jeff Bezos' um, overall process of going to a meeting because he requires that you have a project description. And the project description is the same thing as creating a marketing strategy statement. The marketing strategy statement, according to um, our book, needs to have a value proposition. And in our 
um, specific project, it was restaurants. It also needed to have a target market description and a sales market share and marketing mix um, description as well. So I actually made that description in our document a little bit bigger so we can take a look at it. So our goal is to have Amazon local restaurants be the one-stop solution for customers to discover and place meal orders from great restaurants beginning in Seattle. So that's what our value proposition was. These are prime members and we want them to have a great experience from great restaurants. So we were gonna be picky about the restaurants that we chose that would be on our platform. So who are we gonna target? Well, we're gonna begin in Seattle with a takeout offering, which is um, then going to be expanded next into Dallas and throughout 2014. And by the end of the year, we expect to be in 40 regions and handle 300,000 total orders a year. So there you have our sales, our market share, and marketing mix. Again, there's more detailed information, but that is um, confidential, but this is a gist of it. It has all parts of that marketing strategy statement within the documents that are required by Jeff Bezos and his executives. And again, that's part of the marketing developments, um, the marketing strategy development step, which again, gets us to the product development that will be given to our end consumers. So as you saw, we did a lot of business analysis. Once we identified that it was going to be in Seattle and Dallas, we had to present a whole financial um, finding with profit projections about the, the specific product, especially because we were gonna be using developers to create the phone app that would be on amazon.com. So that is the fifth step after you create your marketing um, strategy um, statements and identify your target markets. Then we actually develop the product. In our case, um, developing the product is something physical. And from our standpoint, uh, it was a service that is a physical phone app that can be utilized on Amazon.com. And that was our end all be all product um, that we developed. So we needed to test the market. And again, we tested the market um, by going into a specific uh, area and to have realistic settings. So as you saw in our overall um, document that we presented to the Wolfpack, it also stated that we were gonna go into Seattle first, what our key performance indicators were, and that we were going to test that and then see if um, we would have to make any changes, especially around meal changes or maybe delivery options. So once we get the testing market all um, completed um, and we actually test in Seattle and then potentially even go into Dallas, we um, really needed to understand the overall market rollout. And again, um, this would be a holistic plan that once we're ready to commercialize the phone app um, on amazon.com for every customer around the United States, that we um, actually then identify city by city, state by state, where to launch, how to launch, when to launch, and communicating that launch. So, this process, this eight-step process, is um, really, really fascinating, and it works, as we obviously see, uh, with Amazon actually using every single step um, that Kotler created throughout their entire um, new product launch um, proposals. But Kotler still says that even by using this particular scope and, and um, process, that 80 to 85 of um, percent of products fail. So from that perspective, there are companies like Amazon and Procter & Gamble that do have a much higher success rate. And so let's take a look at why Amazon Local was successful as well. So from that standpoint, successful products should be customer-centered. And one of the reasons that Procter & Gamble was so successful is because they're customer-centered. It's team-based, 
Um, so again, it's not Amanda Malave and her colleague defining an idea and just doing whatever we want. We actually work with executives and they give us feedback. And, and if they didn't like the idea, they would give us information on how we can improve or tell us to go back to the drawing board. So team base is super critical. It's systematic. There's a process. Everybody knows it. Everybody's trained on it. And there's data that needs to be part of that overall proposal. And you got to look for customer problems and solve them. So here's an example of another company that does a great job of this, which is Intuit. They um, have the, the lighting of that customer in the middle of their processes on how do they innovate. And from an Amazon perspective, Amazon has the customer experience in the middle, which is really identified our customers are those customers that are prime customers. And at the end of the day, our whole focus in life is to provide our prime customers a great experience, exceptional selection, lower prices, to be disruptive in any market that we go into, whether it's healthcare, um, purchasing um, Whole Foods, or um, the Amazon app for restaurants. So you can see how this process was also utilized be, um, for Whole Foods because everybody had that data at Amazon, which stated that classes and education was the number one thing that our customers wanted, but food and restaurants were number two and three. So everyone was trying to figure out how to get into that um, and that uh, sphere or that target um, uh, markets um, and then segmented into that customer base. So objective number three is let's identify once you've created the product, what is the life cycle and how do marketing strategies change through that product life cycle? So the life cycles um, really work through four processes. One is the introduction of your processes. And what this states over here is your sales um, and how it improves and increases at and then decreases through the life cycle and the time um, on the bottom. So when you're introducing a product, your sales are zero. And then you start introducing it and usually, hopefully you have great growth. Um, and as you grow, you're, you're actually improving on your costs and your profits are, are improving. And then from here, it goes into a maturity stage but sales at the end of the maturity stage start to decline. And from there, sales start to fall. And you really basically need to really start another product pretty quickly um, so that you can supplement any declines that you have um, on one particular product with a new product. This is exactly what Amazon does. This is exactly what um, Apple does, um, Procter & Gamble, and all the other big corporations. They really understand this product life cycle. And again, you must too, because we have that target here and it'll be on the exam. So product life cycle strategies also show us that through product development and all the way through the, the four steps, the sales we just talked about um, increase and decrease as you go through the cycle, but so do the profits. So in the beginning of product development, there is a lot of investment, so you're actually losing money. When you're introducing the product in the beginning, um, when you actually launch it, there is a loss, but um, we usually see new products actually make large amounts of profit within the growth stage. And then in the maturity stage, um, halfway through it, they start declining as your profits start to decline over time as well. So let's go a little deeper into each one. So the characteristics that we're going to look at through the market development cycle for products are sales, costs, profits, customers, and competitors. And we obviously are going to have different marketing strategies that we do at each. Again, please make sure that you understand this because they will be in the exam. So at the introduction phase, we know that sales are going to be low that costs are going to be higher, that our profits are going to be negative, 
and that we will be considered innovators um, throughout this entire process. Uh, so we are really going to be targeting the innovators that want the newest, coolest product, even if it doesn't work, similar to Apple Watches. Apple Watches, nobody wanted at first, but those innovators wanted to make sure that they had it because they love anything that's new. And we also know that when we're innovators and our customers love um, that sort of innovation, that our competitors are gonna be few. So our marketing strategy when we are introducing a new product is to create the product um, and produce some sort of engagement through social media, through ads, through blogs, whatever you decide, and um, make sure that you do trials. A lot of trials to make sure that your target um, marketing is going to be great for that um, particular um, segment group. At the growth stage, our sales are rising, our average cost per customer um, is actually uh, decreasing a little bit at the end, but increasing in the beginning. Our profits are rising a little bit, and our customers are usually the early adopters. Um, so our competitors are also starting to come in because they will more than likely try to compete or recreate something that um, has been created um, by that innovator. So at that point in time, your marketing strategy is to maximize market share. So you are going to um, put all of your efforts in marketing to really, really gain that market share from the early adopters. So you're going to market to those folks. At the maturity stage, our, com our customers actually change. It becomes the mainstream adopters. So for example, um, people that don't buy the new iPhones immediately when they launch will more than likely purchase it at the maturity phase. This is where we have peak sales um, and our, we have a really low cost per customer because we've maximized the way that we produce. We have a highest amount of profits th through the maturity stage and um, our main student adopters are actually purchasing a whole lot and we have a, um, but we have a stable number of competitors, but they're starting to decline. Some people did well and some people didn't, and they'll actually get out of the market um, and start focusing on another, or they'll stay in and um, try to milk it as much as they can. So the objective for attracting um, this mainstream adopter is to market in a way that you maximize profits while defending your market share. So do through the decline phase, our sales are declining, um, the cost per customer is still low, but our profits are a lot lower. And this is the lagging adopters. So it's my mom and dad who are in their 80s and 70s, who, you know, 10 years after the first iPhone has been developed, they'll purchase their first iPhone um, because it's at a low cost. So from that standpoint, um, what you want to do is you want to actually potentially reduce your marketing spend um, and milk the brand uh, as much as you can, but potentially put some of your um, marketing spend on a new product and start all over again. So there's a second part to this, and I'm not going to go through each one. I believe you should um, go through each one yourself. But we'll walk through, um, you know, a deeper dive into the marketing strategy. And again, these are the four P's um, and we'll go through each one for the introduction phase. So let's talk about the restaurant business um, for Amazon. So again, we're going to offer a basic product and we're going to market that basic product to Seattle and Dallas. That's the product, one of the four P's. The price we're going to put is um, a cost plus strategy, which is we um, are going to identify how much it costs us to get every single customer. Um, and then we're going to say we need to get this amount of margin on top of it to be profitable. So that's a cost plus strategy for pricing. So if we said, all right, um, this will cost $5 per customer and I want to make a 20% profit then um, I am going to add a dollar to that. So um, my pricing is going to be $6 for every transaction 
that we do on the restaurant app. The distribution that we would um, pick would be very selective. And again, we decided on just two locations, Seattle and Dallas. The way that we advertise would be to create awareness to these early adopters. And so we would actually really target those tech savvy um, folks that you know are really busy and that we know are really engaged with us. And our sales promotion would be heavy sales promotions to get these people um, to try it, potentially even giving it them for free for a certain time frame. Again, um, please make sure you understand all of the marketing strategies uh, that you would go through through the growth, maturity, and decline cycle as well, based off of the customer type that you're going after. So um, objective number four is talking about social responsibility with products, um, especially when you're launching them to international markets and potentially you don't know how they're going to be utilized. So product decisions have a social responsibility to that. It doesn't necessarily mean an ethical responsibility, but a social responsibility to making sure that you're developing products with patents. You're not stealing it from somebody, that it has high quality, safety, and you need to make sure that warranties are considered. Why? Because there is so much regulation out there now protecting consumers that you could get heavily, heavily penalized. So in 1990, there was almost 20,000 lawsuits because of bad products. There's 60,000 lawsuits per year now. So people are really, really adamant about getting high quality. 6% of the time, people are found guilty, but people pay out. But on average, they're paid out $1.5 million. So the consequences are that you really need to understand all the rules and all of the social responsibility parts that you have for your product. There's no room to say that you don't understand the impacts of what your product will have in a US or international marketplace. So international product and services marketing. So here is an example of um, McDonald's and really having to market differently to the French. And in this example, uh, instead of a bun, they have a bag get. Um, so in this perspective, um, you just really need to make sure that you're really understanding the products which are going to um, meet the needs and wants of your target market. Standardization versus customization. Standardization really helps McDonald's, but being, you know, having the same product that they have in the U.S. market is not going to work in France. So they really need to understand where it makes sense to customize or where it makes sense to standardize. Packaging and labeling are super critical, um, especially maintaining consistency. And then customs, values, and laws are really important to consider anytime you launch internationally as well. And don't forget the social aspect of it, the social responsibility standpoint. So that being said, that is the end of chapter nine, and I hope you like the example on um, Amazon Fresh um, because it's uh, very innovative and not too um, uh, shared uh, a be above and beyond the Amazon sphere of things. So I hope you enjoyed it. Mahalo. Wow.